Hello. So uh, Maite has very kindly asked me to give you a 15 minutes lectures on singularity resolution and observational consequences in new quantum cosmology. So obviously I will not have time to go into the details. This is why I have already written most of the equations to try to spend time extracting physics from them and not trying to derive them, which would obviously require hours if not days. And I also apologize for my terrible French guy pronunciation. I hope you will understand at least something. So, the key point here I want to make is to try to let you understand how is the Big Bang singularity result in new quantum cosmology. You know that the usual um, Einstein equations are leading to a kind of pathology of space-time in the sense that they are singular which means that the theory is not correct. I mean, space-time is not ill. What is ill, of course, is the model we are using to describe it. One possible way to try to go beyond Einstein's theory is to go to the Wheeler-David theory, which is the most simple and naive quantization of Einstein's equation. The problem is that the Wheeler-David equation is usually still singular. I mean, the Big Bang pathology is not cured in a generical way in the Wheel of the Vit approach. And a very important and interesting point is that loop quantum cosmology evades the uniqueness von Neumann theorem because it is inequivalent to the Wheel of the Vit equation already at the kinematical level, which means that already at the kinematical level something new happens, and this will lead to the singularity resolution. What happens is that instead of a um, differential equation, we end up with a kind of difference, finite difference equation. Psi is the wave function of the universe. And the key point is that if you begin from our expanding large classical universe, that is big values of this n integer, and if you go backward in time, the Big Bang would correspond to n equal zero, to a vanishing n. But the point is that you can continue to negative values of n, and this physically corresponds to the contracting branch of the universe. And this is a big bounce picture. There is a contracting branch of the cosmic history before the expanding branch in which we are living. The key point is that this singularity resolution, which is a mathematical consequence of this equation, um, has a clear meaning in terms of quantum geometrical effect. There is a repulsive force which somehow stabilizes the universe just like the uh, usual hydrogen atom is stabilized by the Heisenberg principle. So the key point is that this result was shown to still hold for many different cases. For all the exactly solvable models, that is, with a massless scalar field in a flat universe, with a positive curvature, negative curvature, positive and negative cosmological constants, and even more importantly, for um, anisotropic universes, that is, for a wide class of Bianchi models that are very relevant in this kind of cosmological settings. It has also been shown numerically that uh, most of the quantum dynamics is usually well encoded in the semi-classical behavior, which is very interesting for phenomenological purposes. So let me right now begin with uh, an FLRW metric where A is the scale factor of the universe and N is the Lapse function. So you have a pair of conjugate variables with a non-vanishing Poisson bracket. Uh, gamma is a Barbero in near Z parameter, which is irrelevant in standard general relativity, but which plays an important role when quantizing the theory. This is a fiducial volume, and, um, and uh, this uh, delta function here is basically the area gap for the eigenvalues of the area operator in loop quantum gravity. You can then compute uh, the Hamilton function, and a very interesting result is that instead of b square root of delta here, you have the sine function. And the origin of this sine function is that there is no operator associated with the HTK connection loop gravity, but only with its holonomy, which is somehow obvious when you understand the way curvature is measured in standard general relativity, and which also is reminiscent of the concept of Wilson loops in particle physics. 
from this Hamiltonian, it is straightforward to compute the resulting Friedman equation. If you remove this term, you recognize the standard general relativistic Friedman equation, right? The square Hubble parameter is equal to the density of the universe, and we know, it's obvious, that if you evolve backward in time this equation, you end up with a singularity, rho goes to infinity. And here, just because of this quadratic term, rho times rho, with a minus sign, and minus sign is non-trivial, this is not what happens, for example, in brain world cosmology. So because of this negative sign in front of the quadratic correction, now it is completely clear that rho is bounded from above at the value of the critical density, which is of the order of the Planck density. So it means that everything becomes regular. And you can even compute the equivalent of the Rechoudhury equation in the framework of full quantum cosmology, and obviously it is also modified with this correction. The very important point is that this phenomenological result has also been uh, obtained in different frameworks. You know the problem in the so-called mini superspace approach is that you first use the symmetries and then you quantize. I mean, this is somehow obvious to try to do that. And as Robert says, there is no physics without approximation. But still, this is not what you would like to do. In this quantum reduced to quantum gravity model, they do it the other way around. They begin by quantizing, and then the symmetry uh, reduce the model. This is very, very good. The problem is that the price to pay is a kind of gauge fixing. So the question is still open. But the very nice point is that now the Hamiltonian function can still be calculated. There is this additional term, but as you can obviously see from it, the Big Bang singularity is still resolved. There are some open discussions about what happens in the contracting branch of the universe. It could be emergent instead of contracting, but that's not the point. Singularity is still resolved in this approach. And most interestingly, this is still true in so-called group field theory. You know, in group field theory, what happens is that you, you basically understand the large-scale cosmological dynamics as a kind of hydrodynamical limit of the fundamental group field theory degrees of freedom in the so-called gross pitayevsky approximation. And very importantly, you still recover the modified Friedman equation with just a kind of rescaling of the critical energy density, which is not of very high relevance for my purpose here. So I would consider the um, Big Bang revolution as something very robust in low gravity. How to go beyond that? I mean, the first thing to do is to try to compute in a very accurate and better way the dynamics of the background, right? This is what we, what, what, what we can do first. So we define two variables, x and y, x the square root of the uh, potential and kinetic energy densities contained in the massive scalar field that I assume to be the main constituent of the universe. And you can derive the evolution of the density in the remote past of the contracting branch of the universe. And the interesting point is that you see that it is pseudoperiodic, with delta playing the role of a phase. And this is something important. Why? Because it has been claimed that loop quantum cosmology predicts inflation. And that's correct. But that's not a big deal. I mean, inflation is a very strong attractor. So if you put a scalar field in the universe with a correct potential, and you begin at the Planck density, you will nearly unavoidably end up with inflation. This is not something very impressive. What is very impressive is that loop quantum cosmology predicts how much inflation you have. Let me explain you why. Because now we have this contracting phase of the universe before the bounce. And because of that, it's completely obvious that delta is the variable on which you would like to, to which you would like to assign a flat PDF, a flat probability distribution function, because delta is contingent. There is no reason for physics to have chosen a specific value of delta in addition we can mathematically show that a flat PDF for delta is preserved over time. If you do that, just because there are highly non-linear relations between x, the fraction of potential energy, and delta, for nearly all the values of delta, you have the same value of x, which is of the, uh, 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 of the, um, of the order of 10 to the minus 6. 
It means that x is not anymore a random variable as in standard general relativity. Now the value of x, except if you fine-tune the model, is predicted by loop quantum cosmology. And what is very nice is that the value of x tells you how much default of inflation you have, because they are both um, uh, isomorphic one to the other. And you can compute that the PDF for the number of defaults of inflation is now something like that, picked around 140. I like very much this number of 140, because it is above 70, and you know that 70 is the value which is required by observation, so hopefully it is above 70. But still, it's not very high. It could be nearly anything between 70 and 10 to the 12. It could be 1 million, it could be 1 billion, but still, it is close to the minimum value, which is excellent for phenomenology, because if inflation is too long, then all the subtle physical quantum gravity effects are beyond the Hubble sphere. So this is a very interesting value, and the fact that the duration of inflation is predicted in the model is something that I consider as very elegant and very strong. Unfortunately, up to now, I have neglected shear. And I cannot do that, because you know, if you add up anisotropies to the Friedman equation, they scale as 1 over a to the 6, which means that in standard cosmology, they dilute faster than anything. But for this very same reason, it means that they increase faster than anything in the contracting branch. And therefore, I cannot generically neglect anisotropic shear stress at the bounds. I have to take it into account. So this is why you can, for example, switch to a Bianchi one universe. And this is the uh, um, Friedman equation taking into account anisotropies, and sigma q is the quantum shear that appears in quantum uh, cosmology with uh, pi's being the, um, the conjugate variables to the ci's. And you can play the same game and compute the amount of defaults in this case. And the result is that the PDFs are shifted to the left. That's not surprising. You have less energy available for inflation. Part of the bounce is now triggered by the shear and not by the energy density. And therefore, you have less amount of inflation. That's excellent, because it was already quite small. And now you say it is less. So basically, it means that LQC predicts for a massive scalar field that the amount of inflation is between 70 and 140. And this is something like, to my knowledge, no other theory uh, can predict, at least at this level of simplicity, in physics. Then you can go beyond the quadratic potential, that is a massive scalar field. You can, for example, put a, a linear potential, you can put a kind of string theory potential, or you can put a Starobinsky potential. I like Starobinsky potential, because you know, it comes from quantum gravity, but that's not the point, because this is the historical potential, the first one, and very, um, very nicely, it is also the one which is now favored by the data obtained by the Planck collaboration. With the Starobinsky potential, the, change, the, the game is somehow changing, because it's a flat potential. So what happens here is that you have so much energy available that you can throw the field away in the potential. So the neat result is that as soon as the potential is confining, this result basically holds. But if the potential is too flat, of course, you can still have a lot of inflation even when taking into account the dynamics of the universe in the contracting branch. Okay. Let's go beyond the background now, and let's try to take into account the perturbations. That's the difficult part. Uh, I have only five minutes available, or 10 minutes available, so I will focus only on tensor modes. You know, tensor modes are the easiest ones, uh, both because of gauge issues and because of anomaly freedom issues. So, a very interesting approach has been developed called the dressed metric approach, where people are really trying to deal with quantum fields on a quantum background using very nice and powerful theorems from loop quantum gravity. So the Hilbert space is really defined as a tensor product of the Hilbert space from the background and the Hilbert space for the perturbations. And you only quantize everything at the same time. And the neat result is that the wave function for the perturbations 
is basically a standard Schrodinger wave function, but instead of feeling the classical metric, it feels a dressed metric, which can be analytically computed. So nu and pi are the configuration and momentum variables. Uh, h, big H, is basically the Hamilton function for the background. And the equation of motions for the perturbations can be explicitly written where Q is related to the standard gauge invariant Mukanov sasaki variable. And at the end of the day, this U-tilde potential is just a dressed potential, which is a quantum counterpart of this classical U-potential. It means that you have everything you need to compute your spectrum of perturbation. And this is exactly what is done. And you end up with something like that for the power as a function of the wave number, which is the inverse of the length scale. So these are large scales and small scales. And the interesting point is that you now have a deviation from the nearly scale invariance, that is usually predicted, not in the UV, but in the IR. It might seem strange. How can that be that quantum gravity which is a theory of a small length, appears in the infrared, that is for big sizes. It is not so surprising, because what happens here is that those modes begin to feel the curvature of the universe. Please remember that the main effect of quantum gravity here is to, um, is to have an impact of the curvature of the universe. But if the universe is curved, only the big modes feel the curvature. The very small modes still see a flat FLRW Minkowski space, you see. So it's not that surprising that the largest scales are the ones that are feeling the quantum gravity effects. But the problem, in a way, is that those modes, just because of this reason, have no strong arguments to be put in the Bunch-Davis vacuum. In a way, the Bunch-Davis vacuum is not anymore defined. So you can use the Lubov transformation and you can pick those modes in the uh, vacuum you want and therefore the spectrum can be changed to account better for the data. So the good point is that you will fit very well the observational measurements, for example, for the scalar modes, not for the tensor modes, that are not yet measured, as you know. But the bad point, of course, is that your model is now less predictive because you have more freedom. The problem with this very interesting and promising approach is that consistency is not ancient. You know, um, gauge fixing before quantization is often harmless in physics, but not in gravity, because in gravity, you know that uh, dynamics is part of the gauge because the Hamiltonian is vanishing. So we have to be very careful in gravity. And it is not clear in that case that the subtle consistency conditions that are basically encoded in Einstein theory in the fact that you have a first class Dirac algebra still holds. This is why a second approach was developed called the deformed algebra approach. Here, uh, this is less quantum. This is less deeply rooted in loop quantum gravity, but at least the theory is consistent. It's consistent means that the vectors of evolution are parallel to the submanifold of constraints, and this is what you want. So there is no gauge issues and no gauge anomaly. It's a generalization of JR. I don't know if this is the correct one, but it is one. And the point here is basically to put a so-called holonomy correction where k bar is replaced by this periodic function. There is even an additional, in, an additional uh, integer here that I have not written. And what you have to do is simply to compute all the Poisson brackets between the quantum corrected constraints. So these are the um, structure functions that are not constants, they depend on the Ashtika variables. But the problem is that if you do that naively, you have anomalies, which means that your um, algebra does not close as you would like it to do. So you have to add up counter terms that will be required to vanish at the classical limit. And the very interesting point that I find very beautiful and somehow magical is that all the integers appearing here, all the counter terms that you add up by hands, 
are completely constrained by the structure of the theory. There is a solution and a nearly unique solution. And at the end of those very, very lengthy calculations up to second order in perturbed variables, you end up with this algebra. These are the Poisson brackets between the diffeomorphism and the scalar quantum corrected constraints. And if you know JR and this formalism, this and that are exactly what you have in general relativity. This is Einstein theory. The only difference is this omega function here. Well, omega is 1 minus 2 rho over rho Planck. So when rho is small, omega is 1, and you end up with JR, hopefully. But when rho is equal to the Planck density, omega equals minus 1, which means that here the sign is changing. But this sign here basically tells you whether space-time is Lorentzian or Euclidean. So it means that in the theory, close to the bounds, space-time becomes Euclidean. It means it's not space-time, it's space. You don't have time anymore. That's somehow magical. You know, this is something postulated, for example, in the hartle hawking um, theory just as to make the uh, Feynman um, integrals uh, converge better. And this is something which also happens in quite a lot of quantum gravity theories. But here it happens dynamically. You see, dynamically, you see time disappearing and space-time becoming pure space. And somehow time would appear as a kind of symmetry breaking in the very early universe. That's great. But I don't know if that's true, because this is seen only for perturbations. It cannot be seen for the background for obvious reason that the Poisson bracket is vanishing, so zero equals minus zero. You cannot see it, right? But still, uh, the validity of this result is questioned, but if we all, that's something extraordinarily elegant. And this is a kind of dynamical realization of the BKL conjecture, you know, because now all space points decouple at this silent surface defined by omega equals zero, that is rho equals the Planck density or the critical density divided by 2. So there would be an Euclidean phase around the bounds. You can compute the equation of motion of perturbation in this theory. That's more subtle than in the previous one because now you have the omega term here. So there is a kind of um, hyperbolic spheric mixing. And you can compute the spectrum, which looks like that. Two comments. First comment. Um, interestingly, we have shown that for large length scales, there are some universal LQC predictions. Both the Dresd metric and the deformed algebra lead to the same spectrum, and the reason for that is that we are not sensitive here to the subtle corrections to the equation of motion for modes. We are sensitive to the background evolution, which is obviously the same for both approaches. So that's very, very... Um, I think, uh, convincing for the theory itself. In the UV, we have now this kind of exponential divergence of the spectrum, which in itself is not a problem, because there is a natural cutoff, of course, in the UV, anyway. But the problem is that if inflation is long enough so that the observational window falls here, which is generically the case, of course it is excluded by data, because we know, for example, from the Planck observations, that we don't have a lot of gravitational waves in the universe. The scalar to tensor ratio is bounded. So it cannot be true. You could fine-tune the amount of inflation so that the number of e-folds is small, and therefore the, observe, the observed part of the spectrum shifts to the left. But this is still excluded, because in that case, due to the subtle dynamics of the background, the contracting branch, you have to have a deflation phase. And because of deflation, the normalization of the spectrum will increase, and this is still excluded by the data. I like that very much. Because we have a quantum theory of gravity which is meaningful, which is well grounded in diffeomorphism invariants, which predicts, of course, JR as its infrared limit, which predicts inflation, and which is excluded by the data. So, you know, we have all heard many times that loop quantum gravity or quantum gravity in general is metaphysics. Well, by the way, I love metaphysics. But still, this is wrong. 
Here we really can exclude not of course the whole LQG or LQC and not even the deformed algebra approach in itself, but a very specific setting where back reaction is neglected, anisotropies are neglected, transplantian effects are neglected, and so on and so forth. But at least there are some subfields of the theory that can be excluded by current data, and to me this is an extraordinary good news. By the way, I have just mentioned Transplantian effect. Please do keep that in mind. If you take a generic value of inflation, for example 140, it falls. Everything you see in the CMB is much smaller than the Planck length at the bounce time. We cannot, we cannot continue to ignore that. So one way or the other, maybe with modified dispersion relation, we have to take that into account. To me, it is a very important thing to, uh, to work on for the forthcoming days, forthcoming years, in new quantum cosmology. Let me conclude with black holes. I mean, there are a lot of things to say about phenomenology of black holes. We have recently shown that, for example, it's possible to distinguish in the Hawking evaporation spectrum of fluid gravity black holes between standard models and the holographic models, and the Hayat also showed that it could be that the line structure of the, um, of the loop gravity black holes can be seen even arbitrarily far away from the Planck scale, which is something I like very much, but this is not related with cosmology, so I will not go into those details right now. I want to use my last three minutes to tell you about something which is deeply related to cosmology. You know, in cosmology, the universe bounces, bounces, not when it reaches the length, the, the Planck length, but when the observable universe reaches the Planck density, which means that its size is approximately 75 orders of magnitudes greater than the Planck length. It's not at all at the Planck length. So it was assumed that maybe something equivalent happens for black holes, that black holes actually are bouncing stars. And um, there are very good reasons for that. In that case, we would not have any more an event horizon, but instead a kind of tracking horizon, right? And uh, what happens is that the standard classical black hole solution is glued to a standard classical white hole solution exactly as the contracting phase of the classical Friedman equation is related to the expanding phase of the standard Friedman equation. And somehow quantum gravity allows a tunneling between both classical solutions. So this is the Penrose diagram of those bouncing black holes. And this part here is basically the quantum um, regime of the uh, bouncing Planck star. Uh, the very interesting point is that the bouncing time is m squared. You know, the Hawking time is m cubed. It means that the bounce, bouncing time is smaller than the Hawking time, and therefore the bounce is faster than the evaporation, and therefore evaporation might be seen just as a kind of dissipative correction to the bounce in uh, quantum gravity black holes. So you can compute the metric, and you can uh, explicitly show that it uh, makes sense. And the point I just want to make to conclude is that you may um, really estimate what is the structure of the signal released in the universe by these bouncing black holes. Of course, it does rely on different hypotheses. You have to emit quarks and to calculate the fragmentation function of quarks and how they hadronize and how neutral pions decay, etc., etc. But you can do that. And we have shown that the uh, spectrum has this kind of characteristic shape. And the uh, part of the game that I like very much is that the way this signal depends on the redshift can be explicitly analytically computed. And there is a very weak redshift dependence for physical reasons that we understand very well, and which makes this signal completely different from any other kind of a source of photons you can imagine in the universe. So you see that both with cosmology, with black holes, and possibly also with um, modified dispersion relations, there are open windows to try to test loop quantum gravity, and I find that rather exciting. Thanks. <laughs>